Next, let me talk a little bit about the thread that I'm going to make in here. First, let me say that Sterrett seemed to use their own thread, so I couldn't find anything that size. But I'm going to use a 1224 National Coarse, and in fact, I would like to use a 1228 National Fine, but I have no such thing. And you probably do not have a 1224. A 1224 actually is about a 730 seconds. And they've pretty much been eliminated from common use. But I, I love a number 12 and a number 14. I know I have harangued on that many times before. But I'm using a 1224. And the tap drill size for that is a, is a number 16. Which is that. Number 16. All right. And I'm going to drill this with a pilot, hole, pilot drill. To the depth, let that little circle there simulate the hole. So we want to go approximately to the middle of the hole. And I have marked the drill bit, or this is the pilot drill, to that depth. So I'll put this in the lathe, center drill it, drill this up to the red line, and then put that number 16 in there, drill to the bottom of the hole, and then I'm going to tap at 1224 in the, uh, in the lathe. This is a taper tap. I'm going to run the bottoming in there just for the heck of it. I don't have a plug in that size. These are the only two taps that I had in a 1224 and I really had to... I, really, I spent 30 minutes in order to find those around the shop here. Alright, back over to the lathe. I've been talking too much. Here's the pilot bit and I'll drill up to the red line. And now the number 16 until it bottoms out. And finally, I didn't mention this before, I like to have a clearance hole about 3 16 deep and that's the seventh thirty seconds bit. Why? Because you simply don't need an inch and a quarter of thread. It might cause some interference or binding and that just reduces that a little bit, but that's optional. And using a tap follower, I'm going to tap it 1224. All the way to the bottom. I'm feeding the tailstock hand wheel with my other hand. Although remember the tap follower is spring loaded. As I get in a little deeper, I can go freehand. And I'll go all the way to the bottom. Well, I've done all the easy parts. You can see that's drilled and tapped. And so when I do drill that hole, it will intersect with the hole that I just tapped. Now let's go over to the bridge board. I'll show you how I'm going to hold this and what operations I'm going to do and in what order. But well, I guess I could tell you now. 
I need to, to flatten one side, just the one side for now. And then after that's done, I'm going to uh, locate and then drill a quarter inch hole. And after that, using a special tool that I made, and I'll talk about later, I will form the 90 degree uh, part of it by kind of a slotting operation is what it is. Now you could file that, but it's most difficult to file to a layout line with a four-cornered file. And in fact, I had the kids do that at school, and it would look good on one side, but then when you rotated it over, it, the, the hole was just all over the place and looked terrible. So it was a good on one side, bad on the other. So I'm going to try to eliminate that. This is not an easy operation, what I'm going to show you now, because there's just so many little steps. All right, I'm at the Bridgeport Mill, and now you can see how I'm holding this thing on a special parallel, but the need for the extra length here, because it would be too wobbly if we were just trying to locate it on this rather short piece of round. So the parallel goes from one end to the other, and it's, it's resting on the parallel all the way from about here up, up to here. Now the parallel is custom made, if you will, for this vise, and it's aluminum, 3 16 thick. You could make it out of anything, you could make it out of wood. Could be an old paint paddle for that matter, if it's fairly fairly accurate because this needs to be expendable and I wanted this to be the height so that just a little bit of the round is above the vise. See if that fits back in there. I didn't tighten the vise yet so off camera I'm going to locate a little better and uh, tap it into place and I think I need to locate the exact position of that hole right now so I'm going to take this back to the bench and locate the hole because what you see there with the magic marker really is just uh, an approximation so I need to determine where that hole is going to be I'll take that right off my sample I did a little bit of layout now so looking at the prototype on the front you can see that the center of the hole is not quite in the center of, uh, of this portion of the tap wrench so I have determined that from this corner to the layout line is a quarter of an inch. Now I may lose that dimension here when I mill that flat and if I do I'll just relay that, uh, relay it out. The vise is clamped tightly. Now notice that I allow just a little bit to stick out of the vise. Just enough for me to catch this uh, wiggler here so I can find the center. And that's the first thing I want to do is find the center line of the work. And then I'll set the DRO. But the stock is 7 16 diameter. Half of that is 7 30 seconds. And in a decimal that's point, uh, 0.219. And this very small steric uh, edge finder here is 100 thousandths in diameter. So the radius of that is 50 thousandths. So you can see that I'm going to move it in once I find the edge with this, 269, I think I'll just call it 270 thousandths. throws up. It slipped off so I'll do it again. Alright, now I'm going to zero out my DRO. Raise that up out of the way. That's in the Y axis. And we would in uh, 270 thousandths. I'm looking at the DRO. You can of course dial it in if need be. There we go. So I'm right on the center now. Uh, 
center line of the work with the spindle and I'm locking the table. The dimensions of the tap wrench across the flats is about 300 thousandths. So in order to uh, produce that 300 thousandths, remember that 7 sixteenths stock. So if we would uh, subtract the 300 from 0.437, end up with uh, a figure, well, and half of that amount is 68,000. So I'm taking 68,000 off of each side. Now, since I put a 3 8 end mill in there, I do not have to worry about the end mill as long as I stay on center here. I don't have to worry about the, the cutter hitting the sides of the hardened vice jaws as long as I just move in the x-axis. So I'll come down, touch off, zero out my knee dial and come in 68 thousandths. I'm very close to the work. I have touched off. Now I have to be careful that I do not strike the taper over here because I'm very close to that. Well, I'm going to do my feeding when I'm basically on the center part. My collar is zeroed out. Remember, I need to come up 68 thousandths all together. So I'm just going to go back and forth. Like that until I get my 68 thousandths. Forty thousand. Well, have a look at what I did here. I relayed out the hole with the red sharpie. Remember, I had machined that off. I installed a drill chuck with the center drill, and I am ready to spot it right now. Now I have switched to a quarter inch bit and notice that it's a stubby. I love my stubby bits because I don't have to change the height of the, the table. I'm going to drill right through and I don't care if I drill into my aluminum sacrificial parallel. That's what it's for. And now comes the most difficult part of the entire project. Starrett no doubt had a brooch, a thousand dollar brooch, that would produce that hole. They would have drilled a certain size hole and then just push the brooch through there and perfection would be achieved, you know, in a matter of seconds. Well, I don't have a thousand dollar brooch, so how am I going to do it? I had to stop the project at this point and make an announcement. I had a lot of technical difficulty in making this video and in fact I lost a lot of the footage, a lot of the actual video so I am now shooting a few things that are out of sequence and then I'll be back to the regular video. I hope I can blend it all in and some of this makes sense to you but essentially while I was making the uh, slot here, the angular slot, that's where I lost the footage 
and I uh, had some false starts and some troubles and the techniques that I was going to use for that. This is the genuine steroid here. And uh, so I went out in the garage and I, I tried doing it with the shaper and so that's the first uh, video that you're going to see here. That was also unsuccessful. I worked fine on the on the sample but I don't think it would would be a solution for those of you at home uh, or for myself for that matter. Well then I retooled up, I made some tooling and I was back on the milling machine and I'll do some samples and this is, is the sample that I do on both the shaper and the milling machine but the actual slot uh, I lost the video for that so uh, that is just going to be reenacted a little bit but I think you can still get the idea uh, how to do it and essentially at home you're probably going to have to file it anyway. Alright, out to the garage and uh, I think it's interesting to see how I did this on the shaper even if it doesn't apply to uh, what you're doing at, uh, at your house. So uh, the next 10 minutes is all pieced in and then we're back online I hope. And be sure and watch part 3 and 4. I'm at the little road shaper, which I haven't featured too much in my videos, but I wanted to show you one possible way of putting the notch into the little tap wrench. Notice the tool and the tool holder. This is just a sample piece with several quarter inch holes drilled in it and I'm showing how that, uh, that notch is made and notice the little chips. So the only thing that I'm uh, doing on this machine besides the reciprocating motion is feeding down. There is no other feeding done and that's maybe 60 or 70 thousandths or so making a few dozen passes and I end up with a I have repositioned the work so that the tool is in the next hole and uh, let's get started and remember I'm just feeding in the vertical down motion. You see it to start to cut. And let's do one more hole just for the pure pleasure of it. As you can see this method on the shaper of uh, forming that hole is quite successful on a scrap piece but it just isn't going to be uh, very adaptable to, to the little tap wrench because this is going to bend or break off. Uh, there's just too much unsupported so back to the drawing board and I'm going to take this tool and adapt it uh, for the milling machine for the bridge port which is what I originally intended to do I'm trying to make this project so simple enough that it can be made at home but probably filing with a square file will be the easiest method of all other than it uh, it's just uh, inexact and that's what I don't like about it so back to the drawing board here and I'm going down into the shop again but I, I'm glad that I got a chance to show some of the capabilities of a shaper now I'm at the Bridgeport mill and I'm going to show you exactly how I made this uh, irregular hole but 
in the course of making this video, which took several weeks, I had several false starts. I lost a lot of the video. So I'm not going to show you this. It's, it's gone. However, I'll, put, I'll make the setup again, but I'm not going to uh, make another project just to show you the slot in that hardly anybody is going to make this project anyway. So, But at the Bridgeport Mill, I I made this uh, tool holder and this tool, and this this is the same tool you saw on the shaper just a little while ago. And this is the first time in my life where I could have used the Bridgeport slotting or shaping device, which I'll show you a picture of in a little while. Also, I'll show you some close-ups of the tool. But I'm telling most of you that you're going to need to file this uh, because you won't have uh, the facilities to do this or the, probably the desire. But this is the same piece that you saw me slot a few minutes ago, but now I drilled some more holes and I did some practice slots and now I'm doing a final one and uh, enough of gabbing, let me uh, uh, move in on this. These are one quarter inch holes. Again, this is just practice. And I've done the best that I could to align the tool with the uh, center of the hole. But uh, that's kind of bagas bagash, but of course it could be laid out. And, uh, and done more accurately, but uh, I don't think it's worth it. So I'm right on the edge of the work now, and I've supported the work with parallel so it can't push down because the force against the, the work is a little bit greater than what you think, and I'm, I'm just going up and down like I did uh, with the shaper, really, only that was done in the horizontal position, and I have my digital readout in the y-axis set at zero, and I'm going to move approximately uh, 60 thousandths and I'll do it without oil again so that you can uh, see what I'm doing and uh, let me say that I'm using the uh, the stop the depth stop uh, just for convenience so that's as far as it goes all right so I'm moving it in a thousandth or so each time and that's off camera but my left hand is feeding in. And the chips produced are just tiny little things. Kind of fun actually. And then I, I take several passes to allow for springiness because the, believe it or not the, the tool is probably flexing. And so far I've gone in about twenty thousandths. went in a little too far so I'm gonna back it out. I don't want to force it. <clears throat> and then it's just a matter of judgment as to how deep, and I've gone 52,000 so far, and it's looking pretty good. And that's all there is to it. Okay. Now, as you can see, I've done several of them, but the last one that I just showed in the video has the black arrow. And a tap will fit in there nicely. Now, let me show you the setup for the actual project, uh, although this is just a reenactment. Now, here's the reenactment, but I'm not actually going to cut it because it's, it's already done, but the uh, the work was uh, held like this, and at that time this hadn't even been cut off. It was extended. There's a parallel under there, but the parallel also had a hole or a slot in it so that the cutter would not hit it. I carefully aligned everything, and then of course the cutter was 90 degrees from what I, I showed you a few minutes ago. And the, the slot was cut in that manner. 
Uh, you only got one shot at it, so I recommend uh, practicing. That's what I did before before I did that one, and then, and then I lost all of the video, and you know, a lot of time has elapsed, so I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. But that's that's the essentials of, of the way I, I cut that. But it's, uh, it's really a difficult operation and more difficult than the whole rest of the project itself. Let me take the tool out and show you what that looks like. First, the tool. The tool is just a piece of 316 square high-speed steel. It's a lathe bit, in fact, and it's uh, 90 degrees, naturally, and then ground at an angle. I don't know what angle it is. That looks a little too steep, but remember some of that angle is lost because it's, in fact, held at a 5-degree angle in the tool holder. Then I had to relieve the back a little bit so there was room in the hole for it without uh, without striking. These are all little lessons I had to learn and that worked pretty well and we're taking off again just tiny chips I should have shown you some of the chips. The tool holder is nothing but a piece of uh, 5 8 stock I believe it is turned down to half inch. It's got a shoulder. The shoulder is important so that it can't get pushed up in the chuck or the collet whichever you're using. Also the tool is bottomed in the in this blind hole so it can't slide up and lose its position as is uh, the, and then a set screw to hold it which doesn't work real well on hardened seal but that's a pretty good fit this is 316 square the hole was quarter inch so it was a pretty darn good fit I had to take a little bit off the corners to make it fit and then the hole drilled in the end of here a quarter inch hole is drilled at a five degree angle can you see that it's not perpendicular of course you can but then again in this direction it is perpendicular you can waste hours just doing this especially when you have you're experimenting but that's how I went about that and uh, in a few minutes here I will also show you some pictures of that Bridgeport shaper as some of you are uh, not acquainted with it. It mounts on the end of the ram. The entire ram of the bridge port is rotated 180 degrees so way back there at the end there's a hole and that's the part that you always club your head on if you're able to walk around your your mill but the whole thing would be turned on the turret so that the shaping attachment would be up here where the J head is now. And I'll show you just one picture of that to uh, spark your interest if, you, if anybody out there actually cares. So, all right, let's go over to the bench. Most people, if they're going to make this, are going to have to file this. Now, more than likely, you don't have a filing machine, a die filer. I don't have one myself. I had one at the high school. I really don't like them. They're finger pinchers. And, the file will flex on you. They're just not that easy to use, I don't think. And you have to use their, their machine files, which will not be tapered. So tapered file like this is kind of a pain as well, so that the slot looks the same on both sides. That's the hard part. Sometimes you file it and it just looks great. You turn it over and, whoa, man, did that thing wander on me. So if you're going to do that, again, rehearse it, practice it. But I put a little blacking on there and took a combination square and I... And I laid it out like that. But you can see, even in a close-up, there isn't a whole lot to file. And you're going to have to use a small file, something like this, because this one will fit. That's a needle file, but it's a large needle file. It will fit in a quarter-inch hole, but barely, just barely. But it, that will do the job just nice. Now, it has to be a four-corner file, not a three-corner file. It has to be square. So that's one possibility for you. Put it in the vise and to file it out. There isn't a lot to remove. It's, it's just that uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to do it and do it accurately. So those are the various ways that you can make that slot. Now what I'm showing you right now is totally out of sequence because in fact I have finished this weeks ago and now I'm going to go back to the regular video and finish the other parts which actually are done now but show you how, how to make those and and uh, how to color this so there's still two more parts parts uh, 
3 and 4 after this part 2. So go back and watch part 1 if you have not already done it. But let me cut real quickly and show you that slotting attachment and there'll just be a couple still pictures for that. I'm sitting at my computer now and if you Google Bridgeport Shaper Attachment Images you're going to come up with these pictures and there it is on the back of the bridge port. There's, we're looking at it from the back side. There's the, the regular J head and the slotting attachment right there. The tool would be right down there and it just goes up and down. Let me show you one more picture. I couldn't find any great pictures. Here it is laying on its side but this is the part that holds the tool and moves in and out and you can adjust the speed and the length of travel and this uh, yoke here is what bolts on to the back of the ram of the bridge port and there's the motor. And out it comes. Now make sure you don't take it out until you're sure that you've done everything that you wanted to do. Got some deburring to do but of course on the back side it's not flat yet and there is quite a bit of burr. So that has to be milled off. Well how in the heck am I going to do that so it's parallel with the front surface. The next step is to mill off the other side. Now how to do that, how to set it up so those two sides are perfectly parallel so it isn't rotated a little bit. This is a quarter inch dowel bit, dowel pin and uh, that fits right in there and I had the vise loose and located it and I still have the parallel under there but the parallel of course isn't touching down at this end because I had removed 68 thousandths. So I'll take that out and put the 3 8 end mill in and mill that off to again 68 thousandths and then the milling is done I think. And now with the 3 8 end mill in the collet, I'll just touch off, lock the quill as I did before, and mill off 68 thousandths until it's flat, being careful not to hit a portion of the tapered part here that is very vulnerable because it, it is a high spot on both sides. And I'm not going to show that because that was shown on the other side. So this is the last step on the bridge port. I ran both taps through here again just to clean up the hole. There were some, there were some burrs and spent some time uh, deburring even with needle files into the little V. Do not cut this off yet. You might want to hang on to it for polishing or to take out scratches or whatever the operation might be. So that's the very last thing we'll do. Get that tap out of there. Looking pretty good. Hope it's not too lopsided. Now I've had just about enough entertainment and joy for the day. Tomorrow I'll start on the screw and do the finishing touches and the job is done.